12. Levon Smith On January 18, 2023, a 30-year-old off-duty female police officer got into a fight with four men in front of an apartment complex on Chicago's south side. It's pretty unclear what's being said between the parties in the recorded footage of the incident, but it appears as if the cop broke up a fight between the men. At one point, she could be heard loudly telling the group to calm down. And for much of the video, the officer stood in front of 39-year-old Levon Smith while facing the other three men as if she were protecting him. Three of the men walked away while Smith stayed behind and tried to steal the officer's gun while her back was turned to him. A struggle then ensued between the two, who soon found themselves wrestling each other on the ground. As they fought for control of the weapon, the woman could be heard threatening to shoot Smith if he continued. A few seconds later, two gunshots rang out, and Smith was heard saying, You got me, you got me. The woman simply responded, I told you, I'd kill you. She then shouted to nearby neighbors that she'd just shot someone and that they should call 911. Smith begged for his life, but the officer seemed unmoved by his pleas. She fired a third and final shot. As a crowd gathered on a sidewalk close by, she told onlookers that Smith had just tried to rob her after she helped him by breaking up a fight. She also said that she didn't care about Smith, who was dying on the sidewalk. When EMTs arrived and asked the officer where Smith was hit, she said she wasn't sure. According to an arrest report, Smith was struck in the abdomen as well as the left hand. He died at a hospital just two days later. The trigger-happy cop was put on leave while the department carried out an internal investigation into the incident, which is standard procedure after an officer-involved shooting. A tactical response report concluded that Smith posed an imminent threat of battery and no criminal charges have been brought against the officer. Smith's estate has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against both the city and the rogue officer, accusing her of using excessive force. They're asking for $10 million in compensation. 11. Bob Sundin During the over 20 years she spent working as a waitress at a small diner in Vallejo, California, Teresa Brasher became accustomed to seeing one of her most regular customers, Bob Sundin, almost every weekday. Like clockwork, Sundin pulled into the parking lot early every morning on his way to work and made sure Brasher made it into the restaurant safely. Once the diner opened up, he went inside and got some breakfast. Just like any other day, Sundin pulled into the parking lot on a foggy morning in December 2022. As Teresa walked toward the building clutching her purse with the restaurant keys in hand, a masked man rolled up to her on a scooter. He demanded that she give him her purse, but Teresa managed to get back into her car and lock the doors. The thief tried getting her to leave the vehicle, but she refused. After noticing the commotion, Sundin got out of his truck. Teresa didn't want him to try defending her, but it was no use. She later told the Vallejo Times Herald that Bob wasn't aggressive or mean in any way. In fact, she described him as a complete sweetheart. The two men briefly grabbed at each other's shirts before a gunshot fired. Too scared to stay at the scene, Teresa drove to a nearby street and dialed 911. At the urge of responding officers, she went back to the restaurant, where she saw Bob laying in the parking lot with a bullet wound in his head. He was later pronounced dead at the scene. Teresa was hysterical over the loss of her close friend and regular, especially to such a senseless crime. Shortly after Sundin's murder, investigators encouraged anyone with information to come forward. The suspect remains at large to this day. 10. Vincent Kelly In one of the more odd cold cases to make news headlines over recent years, a masked man wearing a strange floppy hat entered a Washington, Pennsylvania grocery store back in 2013 and robbed a citizen's bank at gunpoint. Nicknamed the Straw Hat Bandit for his disguise, he quickly left after grabbing the money. At the time of the robbery, 46-year-old Vincent Kelly was at the store grocery shopping. Determined not to let the thief get away, he followed him out to the parking lot. As the bandit started driving away, Kelly jumped into the backseat of his car in an attempt to subdue him while reaching for a knife he had concealed in his belt. But he wasn't fast enough, and the bank robber shot and killed Kelly before speeding away from the scene. Authorities released surveillance images of the suspect, but they failed to reveal any helpful leads. 
The case went cold and stayed unsolved for almost 10 years, while Kelly's grieving family hoped justice would eventually be served. Finally, in 2023, investigators gathered enough evidence to make an arrest. DNA on an umbrella the robber left behind at the scene came back as a match to a 39-year-old Pittsburgh man named Keith Wilk. A longtime acquaintance of Wilkes also gave valuable information about the crime that helped fill in the gaps detectives needed to bring the case full circle. Authorities charged Wilk with homicide, robbery, and aggravated assault for what he did. Kelly's daughter, Sierra, told Pittsburgh's Action News 4 that she couldn't explain how great it felt to finally get the call their family had been waiting on for nearly 10 years. And while they were relieved, an arrest was finally made. Sierra said that nothing could possibly bring true closure to them after what they'd experienced. At Wilkes's preliminary hearing, Sierra told news outlets that she hadn't slept in over two days and that she'd been worried the charges weren't going to stick. During the proceeding, Wilkes's ex-girlfriend testified that the defendant had admitted to killing a man who tried to stop him in the middle of a bank robbery. Kelly's sister, Linda Lucas, said that their family appreciated the ex-girlfriend coming forward. She played an integral role in prosecutors' ability to finally press criminal charges. The judge ruled that the case would go to trial, but it's unclear whether a date has been firmly set. 9. Michael Bankston III After graduating from a university in Connecticut, 26-year-old Michael Mikey Bankston III moved back to his hometown, Chicago. At the time, he wasn't ready to figure out the next step in his career just yet and he wanted to take some time to focus on his mental health and family relationships. While grabbing some fast food after a night out with some friends back in September 2021, the 26-year-old saw a man harassing his girlfriend in Logan Square. 22-year-old Jesus Garcia was allegedly following, grabbing and arguing with the girl who kept trying to walk away from him. Instead of giving her some space, Garcia picked the woman up and started carrying her towards their apartment. When he saw what looked like Garcia grabbing the woman's neck and shoulders, Bankston jumped out of his car and rushed over to help. He wanted to see if she was okay, but ended up getting into a fight with Garcia instead. According to prosecutors, Garcia pulled a gun and fired multiple shots toward Bankston as he tried to run away. Bankston ended up passing away from his injuries, and Garcia was charged with first-degree murder. During questioning, the killer admitted to shooting Bankston once or twice. The victim was unarmed, but Garcia claimed he pulled the trigger because he was afraid Bankston was going to hurt him. According to records, the accused suspect is being held without bond at the Cook County Jail, while his case carries on through the court system. 8. Jennifer Ferguson and Rachel Rogers when an employee tries to stop a robbery at their workplace, their boss is often thankful. This was not the case, though, at a Lululemon store in Atlanta, Georgia, where two employees were fired for trying to stop a theft in May 2023. Jennifer Ferguson and Rachel Rogers were both on the clock when three masked criminals stormed into the store and stole $7,000 worth of clothing. As a third employee recorded the robbery through a video camera on their cell phone, Ferguson and Rogers repeatedly yelled, no, and get out. It failed to stop the masked thieves, who even left and came back to steal more things after taking their first load of stolen goods. When the suspects left the second time, Ferguson and Rogers followed them out of the store in hopes of seeing their license plate numbers. The women didn't physically confront the robbers at this time, they simply called the police. Law enforcement tracked down and arrested the three suspects, who had allegedly targeted the store multiple times before. Many, if not most people, would probably agree that Ferguson and Rogers did the right thing by calling the police, telling the robbers to get out of the store, and making an effort to get the suspects' plate numbers. But they were ultimately fired from their jobs for what they did. The women told local news station 11 Alive that they didn't know they were violating any company policies with how they handled the situation. Ferguson said that Lululemon employees are expected not to interact with or stop thieves, and that once a robbery is over, workers have to scan a QR code and consider it a done deal. She claimed that staff members are not supposed to mention the robbery in any notes, call the police, or even talk about it at all. 
Lululemon CEO Calvin McDonald told CNBC that Ferguson explained the policy correctly. He said that the rules were based on the company's belief that stolen merchandise is a secondary concern to their employees' safety. Workers are trained to take a step back and let a robbery happen to avoid injuries. McDonald claimed that the company responds to thefts by relying on a store's technology and collaborating with law enforcement. A lot of people were upset that Ferguson and Rogers were fired, and many have called on Lululemon to give the women their jobs back. But McDonald continues to stand by the decision to let the workers go, and he doesn't seem to have any plans to double back. 7. Police Officer vs. Armed Robber During his routine patrol one night in June 2023, a Boston police officer saw a man pointing a gun towards a Domino's delivery driver. The cop quickly recognized the suspect as the same person who'd allegedly robbed another delivery driver two nights before at the same location. According to a police report, the armed thief decided to open fire on the officer, hitting him multiple times. Later identified as 23-year-old John Lazar, the accused gunman then fled the scene and ran into a nearby building. Meanwhile, the officer got on his radio and reported that he had been wounded in several places, including his foot and back. Thankfully, his wounds were not life-threatening. As the injured cop was given treatment at a nearby hospital, a massive number of officers responded to the scene and scoured over the area in search of the alleged gunman. They found him hiding out on the roof of a nearby building. Instead of surrendering, the suspect ran, and with nowhere else to go, he jumped off the building and landed in an alleyway down below. At that point, Lazar was both injured and surrounded by police. Massachusetts state troopers coaxed him out of the alley at gunpoint and handed him over to Boston police. Lazar was then taken to a hospital to have his injured leg looked at. In the meantime, investigators recovered money a few Domino's cups, a Domino's receipt, shell casings, and a cell phone in the alley where Lazar was captured. Inside the entrance of the building where the robberies had taken place, they found a loaded handgun and at least one more shell casing. It turned out Lazar already had two active warrants out for his arrest, including one that was over three years old. It was issued out of Salem in early 2020 for unlicensed operation of a motor vehicle negligent operation of a motor vehicle, and receiving stolen property over $1,200. The second warrant was issued out of Quincy back in June 2022 for four counts of identity fraud and one count of larceny over $1,200. Lazar also faces additional charges for his more recent crimes, including assault, battery with a firearm, armed robbery, assault with a dangerous weapon, carrying a firearm without a license, and more. He's being held without bail as he awaits his court hearing in Massachusetts. His next proceeding is meant to determine how dangerous a defendant he is. The injured officer has since been released from the hospital and is expected to make a full recovery. 6. Mary Ann Moreno One day back in October 2020, an armed man named Tyler Wimmer went inside a Circle K convenience store in Westminster, Colorado and asked if he could get a pack of cigarettes for free. He had a knife in one hand. In the other, he held a second knife that was still wrapped up in its packaging. The 72-year-old clerk, Mary Ann Moreno, refused to hand over the smokes without payment, saying that she could get fired for doing so. After initially walking toward the store's exit, Wimmer suddenly rushed behind the counter and grabbed what he wanted. Moreno briefly grabbed at the man's arm, not on purpose but because she was reacting out of surprise. She then pushed him. He ran from the scene and Moreno called both her manager and the police. By then, a customer named Larry Wagner had called law enforcement. He later told Fox 31 that Wimmer was scary and acting in a way that suggested he was under the influence of drugs. Wagner said he wished he'd stayed inside the store during the ordeal, but he had to leave to call the cops. Officers apprehended Wimmer after a short chase on foot. He was later sentenced to three years of probation for multiple crimes, including the Circle K robbery. A few days after the incident, Moreno was fired for violating the company's policy against confronting robbers. Management viewed surveillance footage of the incident and determined that Moreno broke the rules by touching Wimmer's arm when he rushed up behind and scared her. After working for the company for over 18 years, this one simple mistake cost her her job. 
Moreno was shocked by the news. She told local news station Fox 31 that she thought running after a robber or arguing with one could possibly constitute a breach of the policy, but she didn't think she was going to be reprimanded, let alone fired, for touching Wimmer's arm when he startled her. In 2023, Moreno filed a lawsuit accusing Circle K of wrongful termination. Her attorney, Iris Halpin, told media outlets that the company was failing to distinguish the difference between self-defense and chasing. She said that Moreno reacted instinctively when confronted by Wimmer, and that her client was fired for having a common human reaction. Halpin went on to say that some retail employers lack an appreciation for the dangers their workers face on a day-to-day -day basis. She also pointed out that any normal person would respond to an attacker by pushing them away like Moreno did. Larry Wagner, the customer who witnessed everything and dialed 911, told KDVR that he was shocked to learn that Moreno had lost her job. He said that he thought it was wrong for the company to even think about firing her. He echoed Halpern's sentiments about how a person's natural instinct is to protect themselves when in the face of danger. 5. Blake Mose While on the clock one day in 2023, 26-year-old Blake Mose was working at a Home Depot in Pleasanton, California when he saw a woman trying to steal a power tool. He confronted the alleged thief, who was trying to leave through the store's loading dock. During this interaction, the suspect pulled out a gun and fatally shot Mose. The woman then fled the scene in a getaway car, but Alameda County Sheriff's deputies managed to catch up to her within 15 minutes of the shooting. They arrested the accused killer, 32-year-old Benicia Knapps, and her boyfriend, 31-year-old David Guillory. Knapps' young child was in the car with them when police pulled their vehicle over. At a nearby intersection, deputies found the suspected murder weapon. The child was placed in the care of a relative, while Knapps and Guillory were booked on several charges, including murder, robbery, child endangerment, and conspiracy. Knapps was also hit with one count of being a felon with a firearm. While riding in the back of a patrol car, Knapps choked herself with a seatbelt so hard that she lost consciousness. She was taken to a hospital for a psychiatric halt and was later transferred to a nearby jail. In her Facebook profile, she described herself as a digital content creator. She'd also worked as a security guard, but her license was suspended at the time of her arrest. She also had an extensive criminal history for theft. The cases against Knapps and Guillory are still ongoing. Blake Mose was a respected member of his community who was supposed to marry his fiancée over the summer of 2023. As a loss prevention employee, he regularly interacted with authorities and was well-liked by local police officers. He even had aspirations of possibly working in law enforcement himself someday, according to Pleasanton Police Lieutenant Eric Silanchi. Sadly, his future and ambitions were taken from him when he was still just barely starting out in life. 4. Robert Cunningham During the end of the morning rush on February 1, 2023, a gunman followed a passenger off a bus in Washington, D.C. after getting into a fight with the person and shot them in the legs as they tried to run away. He then went into the nearby Potomac Avenue subway station, where he shot a second victim in the legs as they were buying a Metro card. From there, the shooter, 31-year-old Isaiah Trodman, proceeded to the platform and approached a woman with his gun at his side. 64-year-old Metro worker Robert Cunningham tried to stop the suspect and was fatally shot in the process. As another Metro worker tried to defuse the situation, multiple bystanders tackled Trodman and restrained him until police got to the scene. The victims who were shot in the legs were taken to the hospital with none life threatening injuries, while another victim suffered a minor hand injury. Those who knew Cunningham were not surprised that he confronted Trodman and put himself in danger in order to protect others. He'd worked at the Metro for over 20 years as a mechanic. Standing at 6 feet 3 inches tall, he was well known among his co-workers and the other people in his life as a gentle giant. But Cunningham also had a self-assured demeanor about him and did not hesitate to speak up when he saw injustice. Officials throughout Washington praised Cunningham and the other people who stepped in to get the shooter under control. But there was also a troubling aspect to how the situation played out, according to Metro General Manager Randy Clark. Clark commended the quick-thinking civilians for springing into action 
but said he found it disturbing that citizens had to step in in order to stop the armed gunman. Trotman is being held without bail on charges of first-degree murder while armed, kidnapping while armed, and assault with a dangerous weapon. His motive for committing these crimes remains unclear. His mother, Althea Trotman, told the Washington Post that she noticed her son became increasingly depressed in the weeks leading up to the crime spree. She said that it even stopped taking her phone calls. She pleaded with him to leave DC and move back to Ohio and be with his family, but the begging fell on deaf ears. In addition to having a troubled mental health history, Trotman was already facing possible prison time for a meth charge in Pennsylvania and hadn't quite been the same since his bad breakup with an ex-girlfriend. Simply put, things just weren't going well in his life. But no amount of problems could justify his decision to target innocent people. Trotman's mental health remained at the center of his court proceedings throughout the first few months of his case. He spent a considerable amount of time at a mental hospital while he underwent a competency examination to determine whether or not he was capable of standing trial. At a hearing in April, prosecutors argued that Trotman is not only competent, but that the exam found evidence of him possibly exaggerating his mental illnesses. They said that the defendant no longer needed inpatient care and asked the judge to send him to regular jail instead. Trotman's defense lawyers argued that his psychological problems were genuine and severe and that he was still experiencing residual psychosis from his last major episode. They claimed that their client's condition could potentially deteriorate rapidly in jail, which would force them to start the process of dealing with his issues back at square one. For now, Trotman remains at the hospital while the court grapples with how to best handle the complicated case moving forward. 3. Michael Brazel a 44-year-old husband, father of two, and beloved hockey coach named Michael Brazel was gunned down in 2023 as he tried to stop someone from stealing his wife's car. His son overheard him yelling, what are you doing, outside before hearing multiple gunshots. Officers responded to the family's home in St. Paul, Minnesota shortly after 7.30 in the morning and found Brazel dying in the street from three gunshot wounds to his chest. His wife, Hillary, gave him CPR but failed to revive him. Brazel was then rushed to the hospital where he passed away from his injuries. The carjackers fled the scene, but an arrest came only two days later. Using surveillance footage from around the neighborhood, investigators tracked two suspects to a car. As it turned out, police were familiar with the pair thanks to other recent incidents. A young man with a troubling criminal history was charged with aiding and abetting intentional second-degree murder while committing a felony. In addition to both security video and his vehicle placing him near the scene at the time of the crime, the suspect's cell phone records also put him in the area during the murder. He also didn't cooperate with law enforcement during questioning. About a month later, authorities charged a second suspect, 18-year-old Tarmala, with second-degree murder. Prosecutors believe he was behind the wheel of a car that was speeding away from the area around the time of Brazel's death. The young man is also accused of being involved in an attempted carjacking and possibly providing the weapon used in the murder. Cell phone data and other evidence have also put Milan near the crime scene. Michael Brazel was a simple, hardworking family man who made his money honestly. He cherished his family and didn't deserve to die. His loved ones also didn't deserve the emotional suffering that's come with this incident. For now, all they can do is wait and hope the killers will soon be brought to justice. 2. Neighborhood Restaurant Robbery It's not unusual for hungry customers to show up at Lucy's Drive-In for a late-night meal. Located in LA's Mid-City neighborhood, the restaurant's been in business since 1969 and is a beloved local favorite. Considering this, it wasn't strange when two men entered the business around midnight in April 2023 and approached the counter. Instead of ordering, though, one of them stealthily slipped behind the counter and grabbed the whole cash register. A customer noticed this and rushed out of his seat. He grabbed one of the suspects from behind in an attempt to stop them from taking off with the stolen money. He tried to get control over the man but fell to the floor. An employee then ran over to help the customer take down the thieves, but he backed off when he realized one of the men had a gun on him. The thieves made off with the cash register, despite bystanders' best efforts to stop the crime. 
the robbery came as a shock to owner Gabriel Perez, who told ABC7 that this was the first time something like this had happened in over 50 years of operation. It was equally surprising to some customers, including Andy Ibarra, who was surprised the restaurant was targeted in a robbery considering its close proximity to a police station. The owners filed a police report and vowed to continue staying open all night and being a place for community members to visit at all hours. 1. Alexander Leonard In April 2021, 21-year-old Keon Taylor and 24-year-old Taekwon Friend visited an apartment in Richmond, Virginia to conduct business with a local marijuana dealer. They told the dealer they were planning to buy two pounds, but after the dealer measured it out and handed it to them, Kayon Taylor reached into his duffel bag and pulled a gun. He made it clear to the dealer that he had no intention of paying for the weed. The dealer immediately charged at Taylor and tackled him to the floor to try and get the gun away. As the men wrestled, the dealer's roommate, 24-year-old Alexander Leonard, rushed over to help out his friend. The robbery victims may not have realized that Taekwon also had a gun, and they probably weren't expecting that it opened fire on them. Leonard was hit and grazed by at least four different bullets. He died from a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Friend and Taylor fled the scene after the fight. Taylor surrendered three months later and was charged with multiple crimes including murder, conspiracy to commit robbery, and gun-related violations. He only spent a short time behind bars before the judge released him to his mother's custody pending the outcome of the case. Leonard's family members were heartbroken by this decision. In December 2022, Taylor pleaded guilty to murder and robbery charges in exchange for getting the robbery conspiracy and felony gun-related charges dropped. More than two years after the deadly robbery, Taekwon Friend is still at large. Thanks for watching. Would you rather break your ankle while fending off a home intruder but avoid having anything stolen, or have a few thousand dollars worth of valuables taken from your home but come out without any injuries? Let us know in the comments below.